Hello there, my fellow fantasy vikings, and welcome back to another Warhammer Fantasy lore video. After a very long absence from this playlist and series, we are finally returning to one of the most dreaded factions of Warhammer Fantasy, the mighty Norse guns. However, we're not gonna be talking about the faction itself today, but one of its famous characters and champions. His name is Wolfric, and this is gonna be the first of two videos on his saga. Also, if you're an old school Conan fan, this particular story should be even more appealing to you. I'm your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? Ah, Wolfric the Wanderer, also known as the Eternal Challenger, the Inescapable One, and the World Walker. He is the ultimate embodiment of Norskan Raider, Warrior, and Chaos Champion. Once upon a time when he was younger, Wulfric was a Chaos Champion of the Sarl tribe of Southern Norska. He was a warrior born who bore the marks of the Dark Gods upon his flesh. He was ever renowned throughout the holdings of the tribe and beyond as a superlative warrior, feared for his prodigious strength and unmatched skill at arms. Wulfric forged his infamy by taking the heads of every rival Chaos Champion crossing his path, proudly displaying them for all to see as a declaration of power and the folly of challenging him. Unfortunately, as it always happens, pride would prove his downfall. It was in 2519 IC that a massive bout of tribal conflict erupted between the Sarls and their old rivals, the Acelings of the North. The Acelings were led by their king, a terrible chaos lord called Torgald. Outnumbered and outmatched, it seemed that doom had come for the men of the Sarls. However, the Sarls themselves were not entirely helpless. Their own king, a chosen of Tsinch known as Viglundar, was a cunning war leader, who possessed great wealth as a result of profitable raids. Recognizing the skill of Wulfric, Viglundar offered the champion untold wealth and the hand of his daughter, if he would gain victory for the tribe. Wulfric, although looking down upon Viglundar as a pathetic shadow of his predecessors, nonetheless took the chance to gain even more power. Unbeknownst to the Sarl, to Wulfric, and the Acelings, the entire war was nothing more than a highly complex scheme enacted by Viglundr to eliminate Torgald, thus allowing his more pliable son called Sveinbjorn to take the throne of the Acelings. This, in turn, would engender an alliance with the Northern tribe that would see the power of Viglundr and that of the Sarls increase twofold. At a now legendary battle of the Thousand Skulls, the Sarls and the Acelings clashed. Among the carnage, Wulfric found the mighty Aceling King and cut off his head. With the death of the King, the Acelings quit the field and victory was in the hand of the Sarls. That very night, as was the custom of northern tribes, a great feast was held in Wulfric's honor. No man or beast, Wulfric proclaimed, had fought more fiercely in the battle than he, and none, he swore, would outdrink him in victory. Using the very skull of King Torgald as a drinking vessel, Wulfric had matched words with deeds. It had taken eight barrels of meat to put him under the table, a feat which impressed even the ogres that fought alongside him. Before he was completely overwhelmed by the mead, however, the drunken Wulfric began to boast of his exploits. And before the story was done, he had slain every beast of the Chaos Waste twice, and beaten the emperors of the Empire, Nippon and Cathay all at once. However, it was the champion's final boast which brought doom upon his head. He claimed that he was the equal of every warrior of the realm of the mortal world or in the realm beyond the flesh. That night, Wulfric was visited by an emissary of the Dark Gods. The demon would lead him to paradises, to necropoli and fantastic netherworlds. He saw the gleaming towers of the elven folk, the gilded halls of dwarven lords and the ramshackle fortresses of orcish chieftains. 
the emissary spoke of how Wolfric's brazen words had offended the gods, but it also intrigued them just enough to challenge the champion to prove his words. He was now charged to travel the four corners of the world, and to seek out the best challengers, the most monstrous creatures, and slay them all in single combat to prove his worth. If he failed, then his soul would be forever cursed by the gods, and deemed unworthy to join them in their halls. When Wulfric awoke, he found himself speaking in a thousand different languages, his tongue having been twisted in a sharp, fluted shape like that of a bird. A shaman of the Kurgan tribes recognized this as the gift of tongues, and enthusiastically proclaimed that Wulfric was blessed indeed. Long story short, this ability allowed them to issue challenges to warriors of any race in their own language, magically compelling them to fight him. Wulfric, a short temper man by any standard, made certain that the Kurgan died slowly. The first test from the gods was to hunt down the tomb lord Kareops and offer his shriveled remains to Nurgle. Thus, Wulfric was charged to travel to the baking deserts of Kemri, a voyage undertaken by only the boldest of Northmen, for the desert was many, many leagues to the south. In order to accomplish his job, Wulfric required transportation beyond the abilities of a mere longship. In the end, it was Sigvader, a grizzled marauder and longtime comrade of Wulfric, who solved the problem. For he had heard stories of a ship blessed by the Dark Gods with the power to circumvent the greatest distances in the blink of an eye, which was in the keeping of a Chaos Sorceress, the scaling witch Bagayar. It had taken all the treasures he had seized from King Thorgald, as well as all the silver Viglunder had paid him to accomplish that job, to assemble an army big enough and powerful enough to overcome the unholy defenses of this sorceress in her fortress. In the end, Wulfric hunted down the sorceress and hacked off her limbs before boiling her alive in her own cauldron. The treasures and the artifacts outside of the ship itself he had left to his warriors to plunder, for he had come only for the longship, which he then named the Sea Fang. The Sea Fang indeed was not an ordinary vessel, for it was not mere flight that allowed its legendary ability, instead relying on fading from the mortal world into the realm of the gods, traveling upon the winds of chaos themselves. With such power at his command, he would be inescapable. Even the men of Norska, so used to the unnatural power of chaos, couldn't help it but feel awed and reverent whenever the power of the Seafang was working. Indeed, with every invocation of the vessel's magic, the demons bound within it demanded an offering of blood before they could ferry the Norsemen through the ethereal realm of chaos. The only offering it wanted was Wulfric's own blood. But despite that, Wulfric made certain that every new addition to the crew would feed the new warrior's blood to the dragon-headed prow. With the demonic prize finally in tow, Wulfric traveled to the land of the Tomb Kings, laying low the offering demanded of him by the gods and holding the Tomb Lord's shriveled innards high for the pleasure of Nurgle. Over time, his legend grew yet more fearsome as he stalked and slaughtered fell beings in service to the gods. It was Wulfric who faced a giant in battle, killed it, and then scalped its hairy head for a cloak. It was Wulfric who traveled deep into the troll country and slaughtered the monsters there like sheep and cattle. It was Wulfric who journeyed to the ancient cairn of Jarl Unfir, who arose as an armored mighty white, only to have its bony back broken over the champion's knee. Men came from all across the north to fight at the side of one so favored by the gods, in the hope that they too might catch a bit of his greatness. Tales of a hulking champion, clad in black steel and bones, wielding a dark sword had spread so far as to be spoken of in awed whisper by Kurgan nomads, as well as in the bloody holes of many Norskan barbarians. And thus, the fame of Wulfric grew to gargantuan proportion, and his name lived well in the sagas of the north and the nightmares of the south. Wulfric, thus cursed into an eternity of unending battle, 
hunted down and slew the offerings demanded of him by the gods. He journeyed to the halls of dwarven lords and took from them glory and gold, killed mighty dragons, and even slew the unworthy champions of the gods from among the tribes of the Kurgan and the Hung. All men of the Northlands honored his name and envied the favor the gods had shown upon him. But deep in his cold heart, Wulfric despised his fate, and despised even more those who thought it was a blessing. His wish, for a time at least, was to break it and return to his own quest for power and glory without the interference of the gods. One day, upon returning from one of the hunts to the sorrow city of Ormskaro, Wulfric was approached by yet another Kurgan shaman, a certain Zarnaf of the Tokmars. This sorcerer told Wulfric of how he could lift the curse of the gods from him, given an ancient artifact of chaos. In return, the sorcerer asked for the sea fang itself. Wulfric, despite the protest of his comrades not to trifle with the gods, again agreed for he sought to once again pursue his own ambitions for lordship of the Sarls, a position he could not pursue for he was forever shackled to the hunt. In addition, Wulfric had long desired to be with the Sarl princess whose hand he had been promised long ago. Zarnaf explained that in order to enact the ritual to free Wulfric, he would require an ancient artifact of the Hung Sorcerer Kings, an artifact called the Smile of Sardis. This thing, he said, lay in one of the enclaves of the Chaos Dwarves of the Dark Lands, who sometimes traded with the Norsemen. With the Seafang's demonic transportation, Wulfric and his warriors journeyed to the foul lands of the Fire Dwarves. And there they set out to the great fortress of Dronankul, or Fortress of Iron, in the debased castellate of the Chaos Dwarves, where the Kurgan claimed that the Dwarven Lord Korak and the smile of Sardis could be found. But whether Wulfric obtained this item or not is a story for the next time. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the mighty and cursed chaos champion Wulfric the Wanderer for today. Now, just like I said in the beginning, his journey does not end here, and he will return in the second video. He is also the protagonist of his own Warhammer novel, which actually details most of the story I'm telling here. I'm definitely gonna recommend that one at the end of the next video. What about you? Did you know about this guy before? Is he among your favorite Norse guns, or why not, Warhammer fantasy characters overall? What do you like or dislike most about him? Do share your thoughts or questions if you got any in the comments below. You can also support the channel by liking, sharing and subscribing. Thanks a lot for watching and I wish you all a great and healthy day.